This year's Global Energy Show tackled climate change challenges head on. Over the last two years, out of the top 10 global energy companies, all of them have acknowledged and addressed climate change in their business plan. Out of those 10, seven of them have very explicitly identified a net zero plan for 2050. These new priorities have all emerged since the last time this show happened before COVID. At that time, it was called the Global Petroleum Show. They have now completely rebranded and are addressing these new priorities head on with the new name of Global Energy Show. These new priorities were on full display at the Global Energy Show. I'll take you through a few very specific examples of how different companies are addressing these new challenges right after this. A few minutes ago, I referenced the top 10 energy companies in the world. Their combined revenue is over $2 trillion. That's a lot of lives that are impacted by all of those companies. In the US alone, the oil and gas industry employs 10.3 million people. That's a lot of people. And that impacts a pretty substantial part of the economy globally. In fact, in Canada, where I live, the oil and gas industry actually represents 5% of our national GDP. I don't think anyone is arguing that climate change needs to be addressed and that we need to make changes in the way that we produce energy. But there are a lot of lives impacted by this transition in a very tangible way, not just on the climate change side, but also in the energy transition change side. So when the International Energy Agency talks about two thirds of existing fossil fuel being transitioned to renewables, that represents $1.4 trillion in the global economy. And it, and it impacts millions of lives. This is what energy companies are grappling with when they figure out their new business plan and how to address the climate change challenges. Every presenter painted a picture of how their company was playing a role in this new energy reality. In the back of their minds, they were all thinking about how it impacted people and economies. Perhaps the simplest approach, although not the easiest, was demonstrated by the CEO of Greengate Energy. I saw Dan Baladin, the CEO of Greengate Energy, at the Energy Show. He was participating in a panel on the future of electric utilities. In 2006, Dan decided to pull himself completely out of the oil and gas industry, and he started to build a portfolio of renewable energy projects. He now has investments in these projects totaling over $1.6 billion. He's making a very direct impact with renewable energy in this new energy reality. Today, he is completely out of the oil and gas industry and very directly driving the renewable energy conversation. Although this worked for Dan, a full departure from the oil and gas industry is just not possible for most oil and gas companies. Demand for oil and gas remains at a sky high level, and that's creating a significant challenge for oil and gas companies. How will they be able to honor their net zero pledges in this new reality? Perhaps the most surprising comment of all of the oil and gas executives that presented at the Global Energy Show was the CEO of Synovus Energy, Alex Pourbet. For background, let's take a look at the Synovus Net Zero Plan. Synovus Energy has a pretty aggressive plan on how they're going to get to net zero by 2050. 
By 2026, they expect to have all of their methane emissions under control, and they expect to have all their optimizations, at least the simple optimizations completed uh, from a process perspective. They also expect to have three carbon capture projects completed at three different facilities. In addition to this, they expect that they will have new technology to pilot in both their extraction methodologies at the oil sands, as well as new carbon capture technologies. This is pretty aggressive for a four year projection. That's phase one. In phase two, by 2035, they expect their carbon capture to be implemented at three more plants. And the new technologies that they were piloting in phase two, they expect to have in production by 2035. They expect to move completely from steam to new solvents by 2035 in their oil sands operation. This would have a significant impact on emissions uh, that are caused by steam. In by 2035, they're also expecting to diversify a little bit into an SMNR or small modular nuclear reactor project and to have that in pilot by 2035. This is also the time frame that they expect to have completed their CO2 pipeline as part of the Pathways Alliance project. This is a pretty massive construction project all the way from the oil sands to the Cold Lake region where, where their sequestration site is. The third phase is by 2050, and this is the finish line uh, for net zero. They will have completed all of their large scale emissions projects by then. Carbon capture will be implemented on all existing streams of carbon emissions. In addition to this, they expect to have additional process improvements made, uh, fuels will be switched, and electrification will happen wherever it is possible. This is also where they will start to turn their focus towards zero emissions energy opportunities. This is a significant shift from the first example I gave you, where the shift to zero emissions business opportunities um, actually happened immediately, like has already happened. For Synovus, that doesn't happen until 2050, after they've already established net zero in their fossil fuels business. Very different approaches. And yet, why are they not both viable? The enemy, after all, is not fossil fuels, by their account. The enemy is carbon. In general, as I've talked to energy companies at the show, they seem to have four elements to most of their strategies. The first strategy seemed to be reduce methane emissions as much as possible and optimize the processes to do with methane. That seemed to be the quick hit that everyone was going after. And actually it has a pretty significant impact on, uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. Methane is one of the most potent of the greenhouse gases. And so a lot of their emission targets can get hit in the short term by just completely eliminating methane, um, methane releases that are arbitrarily happening as part of the processes. So that's always the first thing. The second major focus tends to be carbon capture and storage. Um, this seems to be pretty common across the board is that if fossil fuels will continue to be a focus for the energy industry, and if the energy industry is going to reach net zero, we need to crack the code on carbon capture and storage. The technology does seem to be there, but it's still very expensive. And so there's a lot of work being done on bringing the costs down of the actual carbon capture process. The third element is to look at alternative fuel sources. So this includes uh, nuclear, small modular nuclear reactors in a lot of cases. It includes some type of use of hydrogen um, in the transport or in the uh, use of power in vehicles. That seems to be a fairly big focus. 
And then the third one, which kind of surprised me, but in retrospect makes total sense, is geothermal. The vast experience that the oil industry has in digging holes in the ground is very, very applicable to geothermal. And many of the drilling companies are really looking at how they can use their skill sets to crack into the geothermal market. And so I believe that will be a bigger focus than maybe we've heard about in the past. After those three, the fourth one is investing in wind and solar. There are a lot of very focused renewables companies that are knocking it out of the park in wind and solar. And some of those are being bought up by energy companies, by oil and gas conglomerates. But for the most part, what oil and gas companies seem to be doing is really leveraging their capabilities in dealing with gases, like the methane um, idea, in dealing with chemical processes like the ca carbon capture and storage component, um, understanding the geology, which is a sequestration part of carbon capture and storage, and also the, um, you know, the dealing with different gases and, and, um, and chemicals, and also the drilling aspects that come with alternative fuels. Those are much more familiar to the industry than, say, branching out into wind power or solar power. The large energy companies that have been investing in a big way in wind and solar are companies like Shell and British Petroleum in, uh, in the EU. And a large part of that has come from public pressure, and they've been acquiring existing companies, renewables companies that have invested there. Not a lot of that is from the ground up. The possible exception there is Equinor, who has really developed a very strong practice in-house. It will be interesting to see how this evolves in the coming years. But right now, it seems like those four areas are the focal point for most of the business strategies that I came across at the energy show. I would say the most telling comment came from Alex, who I talked about earlier. They don't see this whole climate change challenge as much like an energy transition, but more like an energy diversification. This allows them to leverage a lot of their existing skills and investments that they already have present in their company. And it protects revenue, it protects jobs, and it protects the GDP of the countries that they work in. At the Global Energy Show, the mantra of oil and gas companies seem to be Fossil fuels will be needed for a long time. We need to make them carbon neutral. The focus really was on carbon being the enemy, not fossil fuels.